from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning everybody and thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute delight and we're looking forward to three days of very interesting and stimulating discussions. It's my pleasure, I'm sorry I should introduce myself, I'm Fenella France, I'm the Chief of the Preservation Research and Testing Division and it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our Associate Librarian, Mark Sweeney, who will open the programme. Well, good morning and um, welcome to the Library of Congress. As Fenella said, I'm Mark Sweeney. I'm the Acting Associate Librarian for Library Services, which is the part of the library that uh, fulfills the national library functions here. So um, I'm pleased to open today's program, uh, part of our topics in uh, preservation series. And as you'll see, I was on one of the slides. I think this is our 73rd or 74th program. Um, but this one specifically on fostering the transatlantic dialogue um, on digital heritage and EU research infrastructures, initiatives and solutions in the USA and in Italy. Um, today's public program will be followed by two and a half days of discussions and presentations that will advance our current understanding of research infrastructures, focusing on current initiatives, issues, challenges, solutions, and the future landscape um, of research infrastructures. Um, research infrastructures play an increasingly important role in the advancement of knowledge for humanities and heritage sciences. They are a key uh, instrument in bringing together a wide diversity of stakeholders and offer unique research services to users from different countries, attracting new researchers to the humanities and preservation science um, and help to shape our larger um, research communities. Research infrastructures help to create a new research environment in which all researchers, whether they're uh, working in the context of their uh, home institutions or whether they're part of a distributed um, research um, facility, uh, multinational perhaps, um, they have shared access to the unique and distributed research facilities. Uh, this could include the data, instruments, compu computing, as well as the communications. Um, again, regardless of, of, of the location that they are in the world. So these initiatives are at the center of the knowledge triangle of research, education, and innovation. <coughs> producing knowledge through research, diffusing it through education, and then applying it through, through innovation. I trust you'll enjoy the presentations outlining some of the European Union and U.S. initiatives in this area. And we look forward to stimulating uh, further collaborative efforts to make the best of uh, our resources, encouraging standardization uh, of procedures, and ensure access internationally to the advanced research for humanities and heritage um, sciences. So um, again, welcome uh, here to the library. Um, I trust that your next two and a half days will be will be very stimulating, and uh, I thank you for your participation. So, thank you. And I'll now invite Giulio Bazzolini, who many of you know very well, to also welcome you. So just a just few words. I'm Giulio Bazzolini, one that is difficult to share the Embassy of Italy. For me, it's a big pleasure to be here today, because that, I think, is a, an important moment is a technical, uh, in a way, technical conference. We are going to talk about research infrastructure mainly, uh, applied to um, cultural heritage. I think it's very, uh, it's, it's just a starting point. And this event is, uh, should be considered one of these uh, small milestones we are putting in this kind of, of this dialogue that we are trying to start from between Italy and, and the US. I think we will let underline that this event is uh, organized under the Italian presidency of the of the European Union, and I think it's very important that we are able to frame what we're able to discuss today also in the European dialogue. So I'm really happy to, I really would like to thank also um, Dr. Franz and um, uh, Dr. Um, Barbara uh, Berry that is here, that we are really working with us very actively in uh, how this happen. So uh, I give the floor to, to Fanella, and uh, I'm happy to introduce also the our new speaker that is, uh, would be coming from the European delegation. Thanks a lot. So, uh, 
Claro. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Errol Levy. I'm a science councillor, also deputy head of the Science, Technology and Innovation section, uh, the European Union delegation here in Washington, D.C. I am uh, one of a small team of people who uh, work um, together with uh, uh, U.S. government agencies, uh, trade associations, uh, university associations, and also individual universities, companies, entrepreneurs, and researchers in order to develop the uh, relations in research and innovation between the United States and the European Union. I'm delighted to be here because uh, a conference such as this um, is exactly about the dialogue that we need in, in, terms of, in, in terms of research infrastructure and a very important area of preserving our cultural heritage. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Barbara and uh, Antonella, Giulio and Stefano, and the representatives of the University of Florence, um, the uh, National Gallery of Art, who have put this together. Um, my apologies to anyone I've forgotten. But um, I am giving this presentation on behalf of Philippe Froissart, who is the Deputy Head of Unit for Research Infrastructures based in Brussels in the Directorate General for Research and Innovation in um, the European Commission. And I'm very happy to be able to substitute for Philippe. Uh, he's a, a friend and colleague of mine that I worked together with in the international cooperation area, working with North America when we were both uh, based in, in Brussels. And so uh, um, it's my pleasure to uh, give you an, uh, an idea of the European landscape when it comes to how we uh, support research infrastructures, um, uh, particularly in the area of cultural heritage. So I'm going to uh, introduce um, those of you who are not so familiar with uh, the European scene to some strange concepts, uh, including that of the European research area. Um, at European Union level, what we are trying to do is to integrate uh, and make coherent the efforts of the 28 European Union member states and also um, many other countries who've signed up to the research programs of the European Union to create an area of about 40 odd countries uh, where knowledge and information and data and technologies and people and ideas flow freely in order to develop our competitiveness, in order to increase our capacity to deal with society's challenges and to enable us to, in an integrated way, to, um, to uh, collaborate effectively with our international partners, of which the United States is, is number one. So the European, that's the European research area. I'm going to say something a little bit about how we organize our research infrastructures at U European Union level. Uh, ad addressing the European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, or ESFRI, um, and the ways in which we are developing research infrastructures using uh, European national roadmaps. So I'm going to talk also about the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the mechanisms that we use in order to implement and uh, operate and maintain our research infrastructures at European level. <coughs> and the, the means by which we do that, namely the re European level research programs. Uh, we're transitioning, we've transitioned away from the seventh framework program, uh, which uh, provided funding during the period 2007 to 2013, uh, which uh, supported research infrastructures, and we've started the new Horizon 2020 program, which is the latest incarnation of the European Union level research and innovation programs, and which we will be using to support research infrastructures in cultural heritage uh, in the s um, social sciences and humanities and uh, many other things, and I'll mention that later. So, so I've told you what the re European research area is. A group of about 40 countries, including the 28 EU member states that are working together to develop um, um, our the European capacity um, and European competitiveness in research and innovation, science and technology. Our strategy when it comes to research infrastructures, uh, including in the social sciences and humanities, which would include uh, preservation of cultural heritage, is to uh, um, reduce the fragmentation of, of our efforts. It's, as in many of the other areas of research infrastructures, we're talking about sharing existing uh, research infrastructures and optimizing their use, um, taking advantage of some of the cross-cutting and underlying um, um, activities and facilities that are needed across the board for 
for developing our, our research infrastructures. And uh, developing uh, the fora and the policies and the activities to, to, um, to create new investments, to actually take what's existing in the EU individual member states and uh, putting it together, synthesizing it, making it more coherent, um, developing it at the European level by making investments and then connecting those world-class infrastructures in Europe with the best infrastructures in the rest of the world. So when I'm not um, uh, becoming an instant expert in digital cultural heritage on behalf of my colleagues, what I do is I work with um, uh, US government agencies like the National Science Foundation, the NIH, the Department of Energy, and, and many others in uh, looking at how what we're doing in Europe and what's been happening in, in, in the United States is uh, where we, our interests and, uh, and, uh, and plans overlap and, and putting those together. And uh, when we're talking about European research infrastructures, we could be talking about anything from synchrotron radiation sources through to biobanks, through to databases, through to research vessels for the Arctic and astronomical um, telescopes. And so what we've done in Europe is to organize our research infrastructures across the board in all areas from social sciences and humanities through to the, the natural sciences, physical sciences, and biological <coughs> sciences. And we've done that using the European St Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, or ESFRI, where since 2004, beginning in 2004, we've been um, supporting uh, something like uh, now 50 projects, which are um, addressing all of those uh, areas of science research uh, and, and uh, innovation that I've mentioned um, and that commands something like 20 billion euros or 30 billion US dollars of investment uh, for the implementation of these European Union level uh, research infrastructures and uh, with uh, up to 3 billion US dollars a year in uh, commitment to their operations. So it gives you that uh, view graph actually just gives you an idea of some of the areas that we're supporting, as I said, all the way through from social sciences and humanities, uh, where we include some of the cultural heritage uh, aspects, uh, including uh, projects like Claren and Daria that you can see uh, towards the, the uh, bottom left, and which you'll hear more about. In fact, uh, we have representatives of Dara here, uh, of course. And uh, right through to, as I say, physics and astronomy uh, research infrastructures and e-infrastructures, some of which, uh, in fact, um, will have uh, uh, relevance to um, all of the research infrastructures in terms of the management and exchange of data and information. So what you can see are um, some of the research infrastructures which are distributed that have several sites around the European Union and um, in um, countries associated to the our research framework programs. They're uh, presented in yellow. The ones in blue are where the research inf infrastructures are based mainly or entirely on one site. Um, some of these um, are there various levels of organization and development, and that's uh, indicated by the, uh, the ellipses or the circles uh, those in green being more developed and established than those in blue, uh, which are uh, establishing what are called European Research in, uh, Infrastructure Consortia, or ERICs. So it's another strange European concept to introduce to you, the ERICs. I'm going to say a little bit more about what those are in a minute. As well as the European level S3 roadmap, we have national roadmaps, which are developed of course, for the individual countries involved, but also linking their uh, activities and their uh, aspirations with the European level uh, roadmap that is S3. And as you can see, nearly all um, European uh, countries um, have roadmaps in place, and a few are still preparing theirs or updating theirs. So, a little bit more history before I talk, give you some examples of what we're actually supporting and what that looks like. So um, in 2012, um, the, uh, a communication, it's an official policy document of the European Commission was issued on the European research area that I mentioned and addressing 
among many other things, research infrastructures, where it calls in the area of research infrastructures for, for member states to make financial commitments to remove legal and other barriers to the cross-border uh, development and integration of research infrastructures that exist in, in their countries, urging cooperation through the European Strategy Forum for Research uh, Infrastructures, and developing overall and cross-cutting principles and implementation methods and best practice in order to be able to support these world-class infrastructures that we're developing in Europe. Also, um, urging the member states to use the financial instruments that exist at national and European level to support those. In the, uh, I mentioned already the Horizon 2020 program. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment for those of you who are not at all familiar with it. But that will be our main means going forward from now till 2020 to supporting the European level work on research infrastructure. Okay, so this Eric that I talked talk to you about. So this is um, a fairly new uh, legal mechanism or instrument as we call it to uh, help the establishment and operation of, of European infrastructures of pan-European interest. And so these uh, Eric's are consortia of academic institutions, research institutions, uh, government institutions, and, and uh, can include the private sector also who are coming together in order to develop and implement and operate a research infrastructure of uh, pan-European interest. And they are given a special status in order to enable them best to, to go about their work and to invest in the most cost-effective manner. And there are examples of uh, new uh, ERICs uh, that are being formed, including Daria that you will hear more about uh, a little bit later this morning. So to some examples. So to give you an idea of the scale and scope of what we're talking about, uh, I've got about six, six examples, or seven examples. So Charisma, again, who is represented again in this room and that you'll hear more about, I believe, um, is about advanced research infrastructures for a multidisciplinary approach to conservation and restoration, which is very much needed. And as you can see, there are 21 leading European uh, organizations with infrastructures, or working together on infrastructures, to improve um, the restoration of artwork and the complementary, um, um, and a complementary group of activities and facilities to, uh, to do that. We're talking about European Union level support of the area, in the area of uh, between seven and eight million uh, euros, or uh, approaching 10 um, million US dollars, with a duration of four years and led by the University of Perugia in Italy, um, uh, one among um, over 20 organizations involved. Another example, 20 institutions in 30, 13 countries um, developing a European Holocaust research infrastructure or have developed that with 7 million euros, again 10 million US dollars um, of support at European Union level. Uh, with a duration of four years, um, coordinated by the Dutch Institute of War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Sindari, um, I think they are here again today. Someone, yes, very good. Um, good to see you. Um, 14 institutions, six and a half million euros that are provided by the European Commission, coordinated by Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Again, gener uh, duration of four years. Ariadne for uh, architectural data sets and networking. Uh, 25 partners, uh, six, six and a half million euros of e EU support um, up to 2017, coordinated by the University of Florence. And uh, there are uh, many uh, um, uh, August members of the uh, University of Florence, including in this room, uh, Dr. Franco uh, Nicolucci. Uh, so welcome to you. And uh, you'll be hearing perhaps more about that later today. So some ERICs that are in their preparatory phase are uh, t two that I've mentioned already, Daria, whom you'll hear more about. And we expect that the construction costs will be something like $12 million, uh, 15 million US uh, dollars, uh, of which uh, European Union level support will be two and a half. 
And uh, again, a cross-cutting uh, uh, research infrastructure uh, activity is the Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, which, as you can imagine, in a European Union of well over 20 uh, official languages is going to be a very important uh, aspect of how we preserve our cultural heritage and is very, going to be very important uh, um, in the ongoing future. So another example of cross-cutting uh, cross activity is the data service infrastructure for social sciences and humanities, which actually is federating the needs and the, uh, implement and the uh, relevant parts of the implementation of a number of uh, ERICs, including Claren and Daria, and uh, looking at uh, issues like data quality, archiving, access and exchange, also some of the legal and ethical issues that will, that will come up. Um, educational activities and outreach, again, very important and very, uh, ver uh, very important for all of the uh, ERICs in, in cultural heritage and beyond which will, uh, and, and that activity being important is going to be supported to the uh, tune of, it says six billion, I'm wondering whether in fact that might be six million euros over that period. So, the future. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Horizon 2020 because that, as I say, is gonna be our main means of developing um, our research infrastructures at EU level and connecting them with our international partners uh, from the, um, period, during the period 2014 to 2020. It's a, a program that brings together all of the science, technology, research and innovation activities that we have at European Union level. It constitutes something like 10%, approaching 10% of all the research and innovation funding that's available in the European Union. The other 90% being what's, going, what's being spent at national level in the 28 EU member states and and the associated countries. It supports everything from basic research right through to the commercialization of ideas. We are um, more than ever before emphasizing multidisciplinarity in order to uh, make, make the best of the ideas uh, and, and uh, cross-cutting activities. Um, and collaboration across sectors, the private sector and the public sector. So there are three main parts to the program which I will explain now. Excellent science is one, where we're talking about funding the best science in Europe and allowing the best scientists in Europe to work with the best in the rest of the world. We're talking about supporting um, emerging technologies, with, um, projects which have um, far-reaching implications. To give you an ex example of a future and emerging technology, we, are funding, we, are, we will be spending something like a billion <coughs> euros of EU money on the Human Brain Project, which is a, a brain simulation project. Uh, we're also spending a similar amount, or we'll be spending a similar amount up to 2020 on um, a project which is looking at the future, uh, looking at the properties and potential of the material graphene. So that's an example of future emerging technologies. We are also funding career mobility and development. We want European researchers to be able to move around the European research area and have excellent careers where their qualifications are recognized, where their social um, welfare is looked after. Uh, we want to facilitate um, um, excellent uh, research and research careers and in, 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 uh, encourage the, the development of the best training and mobility for, for our researchers. Also, not only for European researchers going around Europe, but also to help uh, bring perhaps for, te for a temporary period, the best international researchers to Europe for a period, or to allow European researchers to move abroad. And there's a lot of that exchange happening between the European Union and the United States, of course. European research infrastructures is a very important part of the excellent science pillar. That's why it's highlighted in red there. And will benefit from a total of two and a half billion, well over three billion US dollars in that 2014 to 2020 period. I'll mention the two other pillars. Societal challenges is where we, of course, using collaborative research, that is consortia of, uh, uh, of uh, largely European uh, uh, countries, to get together to tackle societal challenges like energy, climate, transport, um, uh, social sciences and humanities indeed. Um, but it's also worth saying that in the societal challenges and in the industrial leadership pillars, 
so social sciences and humanities, we encourage the mainstreaming of, those, of the social dimension in all of those areas. So we encourage the consortia that form to address proposals to include social scientists, to make sure that they are addressing uh, issues of, um, of gender, of inclusion, uh, the impact of their research on society, the attitudes of society on uh, the research that they're doing and, uh, and the use of um, the, uh, the results and the implications of the results of their research. So uh, important thing to mention. And industrial leadership is support to, um, to again, consortia-based um, uh, bids, projects, in order to address the key enabling technologies like ICT, biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, the uh, overlaps between them. We also uh, support advanced manufacturing and space research through that mechanism. Also, our support to small and medium-sized enterprises, which is a very important part of our program, where we have high, uh, where we are earmarking something like 20% of the money that goes to consortia to go to small and medium-sized enterprises. It's not a quota, it's a target, it's something we monitor and something that we are uh, paying a lot of attention to. So, research infrastructures in Horizon 2020. What are we trying to do here? We're going to continue our development of world class uh, research infrastructures. <coughs> We're going to continue to encourage the member states to open up their national infrastructures, to integrate their national infrastructures with um, those of others in order to create world class European infrastructures. We are going to uh, look at the cross cutting elements of the, not only the development but the operation and, um, and maintenance of those and making use of the cross-cutting tools like ICT tools, which are going to be very, very important to preserve our cultural heritage. The innovation dimension is something that's given gr um, much greater emphasis in the Horizon 2020 program than in the previous program, the seventh framework program. And so we'll be looking at how we can involve the private sector in not only the development of uh, activities which will contribute to the preservation of, uh, of, of, uh, of cultural heritage, but also to make use of them and to invest, indeed. And that's something that, um, um, that to, um, it would be worth uh, examining during the next three days. Um, and lastly, of course, we want to um, develop and enhance what we're doing at European level, developing our ideas, and that includes working with our American and other international partners in developing the best approaches exchanging best practice. So I'm going to come to, the, uh, to an end soon, but say that what we're going to use is all the means at our disposal to do that. So we're going to be using the Horizon 2020 program, but we're going to be um, encouraging um, the ERICS, the European Research Infrastructure Consortia, to follow um, a coherence and systematic approach, which would start with design studies, go through a preparatory phase, and um, um, in a robust and, um, and uh, understandable and systematic manner to, to support their implementation and operation. That includes clustering of individual projects that are relevant. We will be using the European Union um, Research and Innovation Funds, that is Horizon 2020, but we are also using what are called structural funds, another European concept. This is regional development funds which are, which are given to uh, particular regions within EU member states that are behind in the development that, that we, where we are support, providing extra support at European level to develop their capacities, um, their infrastructures, their institutions. And that's going to be important in preserving digital heritage as well as simply increasing the capacity of uh, those countries to do science and to innovate and to uh, address a number of uh, challenges that they may have in any area of of policy support, agriculture, transport, environment, you name it. So we'll be using those tools. And international cooperation we see as an important and cross-cutting uh, area, so we are encouraging the ERICs to look at what their international cooperation strategies might be, who do they want to, need to work with, and how can that be supported at the EU level. And as I say, part of my job is making sure that uh, that happens. So, to finish, using the 
European strategy, strategy forum for research and infrastructure starting in 2004. We've made a lot of progress in the area of research infrastructures as a whole, including in the social sciences and humanities, and I've given you some examples of how we're trying to support that for cultural heritage for the, and, the, and its preservation. We've been using the ERICS um, as a relatively new mechanism in order to do that systematically, coherently, and uh, to provide um, um, important support at European level. However, there is more to be done, and it's conferences like this at which we will help to develop some of the ideas that will help us to implement, maintain uh, those infrastructures and create new ones as they're needed, and to exchange best practice and ideas. And so with that, I wish you a very successful conference and look forward to the outcomes uh, of the uh, proceedings and to know ways in which I, as a science, science councillor based here in Washington, D.C., can be an aid to your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Errol. Uh, everyone, we can just hold questions till the end and we'll have a panel session. Our next speaker today is Dr. Costas Dallas, and he will be, you're going to be very well up with acronyms by the end of this conference, and as everyone knows, the Library of Congress loves acronyms, but this is a whole new set. So, uh, Dr. Costas Dallas, please come <coughs> forward. Please welcome Dr. Dallas. Thank you, colleagues, and it's a great pleasure for me and for the Daria project which I represent here today to be here in this uh, temple of uh, uh, cultural heritage, uh, the Library of Congress. Uh, Daria, before I say, uh, start talking about Daria, I'll just say a couple of words about where I come from. I'm an, I was uh, trained as an archaeologist and then I moved into the field of museums and I worked for most of my professional career in the field of uh, um, what we call cultural heritage informatics. This is one part of the broader, um, of the broader landscape of uh, uh, digital humanities, or as we like to say in Daria, digitally enabled humanities, in order to give it a broader purview. We don't mean exactly or singly or singularly the advanced applications of, um, of uh, uh, digital technology uh, in order to sort of change the shape of disciplines, because we feel that in the humanities in general, and we find this very, very much in the field of heritage, uh, the situation is such that some of the changes are subtle and they happen over longer periods of time and they really sort of go enmeshed into the practice of, uh, of humanities work. So what was the initial intuition? Where did we start? Uh, uh, for what was the sort of point of departure for, um, uh, for Daria? Uh, in the arts and humanities, we see a scattered and heterogeneous landscape. Uh, there are large-scale digitization efforts in the public, uh, public and private sectors. In Europe, they've been sort of notably spur, uh, you know, sort of, uh, fueled by the support of uh, the framework program for research of the European um, uh, Union. There is a long-standing tradition on humanities computing, uh, now renamed digital humanities. Uh, indeed, there's probably almost half a century now, or even more than half a century, if you go to the 50s, and the initial sort of uh, uh, research work uh, with uh, textual analysis uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the humanities. And there are already some success stories that uh, were with us at the time in which we were sort of building, putting together uh, Daria in the area of epigraphy, in the area of medieval studies, communities that were pretty strong, the text encoding initiative that I witnessed in its very, very first steps when I was um, uh, reading for my, my TFL in Oxford, with Susan uh, Hockey being there. And still now, there's a majority of researchers that have no real insights about, insights about the digital sources, the methods and publications, the resources that they need in order to be able to be enabled in this new digital environment. And this is quite important because in the digital uh, realm, uh, so if we see this pervasive uh, nature of technology today entering all aspects of uh, work uh, that affects all aspects of work uh, in research from uh, sourcing and from sort of uh, capturing data and uh, assessing evidence and the traces of uh, past human activity to publication. And there's a general issue of preserving digital results from one research project to another. That's a very, very major problem that uh, these digital infrastructures, these ERICs, uh, are called to uh, address in, in the European context. 
So, challenges, localization and hosting of digital sources, documenting and connecting to analog sources. And you know, that's a vast, vast amount of such sources out there that are not really in digital form, but still need to be accessible to researchers in the mostly ideographic uh, research that uh, lots of uh, uh, humanities uh, uh, researchers are conducting. Environments for managing, exploring, and enriching digital uh, material. Communication of one's own results in the digital world. Multidisciplinarity. The multidisciplinary collaboration with computer science research. We see a lot of uh, cross fertilization uh, in research that really spans between uh, various uh, disciplines in the humanities and information science, archival science, computer science, and uh, those other disciplines. And finally, community acceptance, paradigm changes in a transition period, and this is quite, quite important. So what is DARIA? It's an integrating activity bringing together digitally enabled research in the arts and humanities in Europe and hopefully beyond. It's a platform enabling transnational arts and humanities research. It's a research infrastructure for sharing and sustain sustaining digital arts and humanities knowledge, and it is made by researchers and for researchers. The difference to some major infrastructures you might be familiar with is that DARIA is a lightweight infrastructure in the following sense. It isn't, it isn't creating large-scale repositories in which it aggregates uh, information resources. It accepts the reality of the humanities world in which resources and actual work and the processing of the activities around these resources are going to remain local, they're going to be distributed. So the real issue here is how to tap the knowledge and how to tap the collaboration between researchers so they sustain a unified uh, European research space in the arts and humanities. So the mission for DARIA is really to use glue effectively, and this glue can be conceptual, can be glue that is methodological, can be also technical in the form of standards or in the form of uh, lightweight systems that connect uh, other uh, resources and other systems uh, uh, at the local level and the national level in order to allow digitally enabled research across the arts and humanities through these services and activities that again are centered around communities. So the difference perhaps to uh, the, what uh, some of you may be familiar from this uh, side of the pond is uh, really that DARIA has adopted from the beginning a, an approach that was uh, distributed in, uh, in action, but planned and coordinated in essence. So the idea was really to bring together centers, research centers from around Europe that had an impact and had important uh, input into the field of uh, uh, of uh, digital humanities, of uh, digital infrastructures for the arts and humanities, and have them talk in order to decide what is needed for the field. This is why one of the major activities that we see in the area is in the area of research, in the area of understanding practices, understanding the needs of uh, uh, researchers. <coughs> and this is why we need another major area of investment being in connecting uh, scholars, allowing them to get on board uh, systems that would then allow them to be able to access resources, access tools, access information, and finding aids and uh, uh, meta-level information about other uh, primary resources. Training researchers and working with communities is an important area, summer schools. Providing guidance about standards and best practices. Finally, providing uh, a network of tools, information, people, and methodologies uh, through uh, registries. So we started, so DARIA started in 2006, very, very much in the uh, framework of ESFRI that uh, my colleague from uh, the Commission talks about uh, a little, a few minutes ago. Then from 2000, 2008 to 2011, we sort of created <coughs> this, it was a preparatory stage in which we built a study that identified where we're going to do a roadmap for DARIA. Then after a transition period, DARIA was effectively uh, legally uh, adopted by the European Union on the 15th of August 2014, and was established as a European Research Infrastructure Consortium. 15 founding members in DARIA today, and a further number of uh, uh, countries that uh, are interested in participating. DARIA, as an ERIC, as a uh, consortium, is sponsored by member states of the European Union. That means that authorities, it could be ministries, it could be national authorities of research, are really participating and sort of really sort of creating uh, DARIA. However, the operating arm of DARIA is based on different uh, uh, pillars. One pillar is a central office, 
Another pillar is a national coordination uh, committee that, uh, in which uh, uh, research institutions that are actually involved in the activities of DARIA are involved. And the third element is what we call the VCCs, Virtual Competency Centers. So these uh, uh, Virtual Competency Centers work with communities. And in these communities, I mentioned some here, literary studies, archaeology, medieval studies, strong communities, there are others as well uh, within uh, DARIA. What does DARIA offer then? What has it produced so far? It has put together and brought together the creativity and the activity of uh, national partners, national initiatives in each country. Some of them funded, some of them not yet funded, but very, very much in the process of being uh, funded through uh, the national roadmaps uh, in different countries. From France, for instance, uh, a, a series of activities including electronic journals, electronic blogs for scholars, and uh, open access archives. Uh, summer schools in Germany, in uh, Göttingen, uh, a digital research methods taxonomy uh, that was created by our colleagues in uh, uh, Germany, actually in cooperation with uh, a project in the United States, uh, the DIRT project, uh, the tools project of Bamboo, uh, the uh, digital uh, infrastructures uh, uh, project that you are probably familiar with. Finally, multilingual training materials. Other services, collaboration tools, uh, infra AI infrastructure, you know, to be able to authenticate and link together um, uh, people with systems. Persistent identification of resources, a major area of research. So in particular uh, fields, we've done more. I'll just say a few words because probably my time will be elapsing uh, pretty soon. Just a few words about what we're doing in uh, the uh, VCC2, which is the uh, Virtual Competency Center on Research and Education. We're building there a project that uh, uh, seeks to understand what uh, scholars uh, uh, do in, with resources, what kinds of activities they are engaging with in research, and what sorts of needs, digital needs for services and tools emerge from this uh, uh, study. And we have a mixed methods approach with a questionnaire survey, and then with a scholarly methods ontology and with case uh, studies. Questions such as, uh, how important they find specific areas uh, to follow in their research, to improve findability <coughs> and access to digital uh, research uh, resources or data, digitizations of, uh, digitization of data of resources that are not already used, etc., etc. This study is going to be published sometime in the second quarter of 2015. We're currently still at the stage in which we're running the research, so note the uh, URL bit.ly dh survey if uh, uh, you wish to participate or uh, communicate with others who might. Together with uh, the NEDIMA project, the Network for Digital Methods in Arts and Humanities, we're building a methods ontology. We feel this is necessary in order to be able to pull together information about actual research methods that engage with digital tools, with digital services, and provide a cloud of information about projects that are using this successfully, how tos suggestions, workshops where people can sort of learn more about uh, each particular method, information and guidance about the context in terms of the research uh, questions that are appropriate in terms of the uh, stage in, the, in one's research that is available for this uh, uh, to happen. And this is going to be expressed in our DFS and scores. So finally, what I would like to say, I'd like to move very, very briefly in a, a final section in which I say where we are now, what are our key themes. First of all, what we want is really to foster national capabilities. And for this, we have 15 countries with heterogeneous developments and we want to sort of create synergy between these countries in order to be able to contribute to a European research space in the arts and humanities through digitization <coughs> programs, through national technical infrastructures, multidisciplinary initiatives, national funding schemes, some of them funded by the regional uh, uh, framework support program of the European Union, and also, uh, as I said, we EU structural funds. The second thing that we want to encourage is attention in the broader community in order for inception of uh, digital technologies that we see, open humanities as being a major theme for that. So in this next year, in 2015, we'll be building on that theme in order to encourage researchers to come up with proposals, to come up with ideas uh, that will sort of put on the table the need to make primary and secondary sources publicly available, openly available, communicate research results from blogs to repositories, and finally uh, encourage good scholarly practices related to the delivery and the use of uh, open uh, content. So thank you, and I uh, will be happy to uh, take part in the discussion further down the line after the end of the session and the panel discussion and uh, respond to questions and 
uh, listen to your ideas. Thank you. So our third speaker this morning is Dr. Luca Bizzati, and he will introduce a new acronym for you, Iperion. Thank you, Fenella. Thank you, and thank you also for your efforts organizing all this. I'm speaking today on behalf of a community who is currently homeless. The community is that of the project Charisma that actually ended its operation in March 2013. And this community organized a new proposal, of which now I am the coordinator. But the idea is not just to continue 10 years of service in Europe of advanced, advanced diagnostic for uh, ultra heritage conservation and restoration, that is, was mainly the core mission of Charisma. This community had the idea of establishing a permanent research infrastructure, perhaps in the Herrick form, a consortium. And this research infrastructure will not be limited to what uh, projects like you, Hartek, the predecessor of Charisma, and Charisma itself did since the last 10 years, but we are trying to establish a research infrastructure for heritage science, including other communities who <laughs> were not, in strictly speaking, in the Charisma Initiative. First of all, opening to the white community of archaeologists, and also under the pressure of several member states in Europe to have a wider picture to extend uh, the concept of heritage to natural heritage. And so we are speaking also of including paleoanthropography, for instance, in this uh, infrastructure. This is possible because the diagnostic methods and the procedures which Charisma used for several years are very similar across these new communities. And this is more or less what we are trying to do in the next four to five years. I had here a, a definition of European research infrastructure, however, they have been nicely introduced by our colleague, the Commission. However, I must say that mm, about 90 to 95% of European researchers don't know what a research infrastructure is. In our case, it's obvious what a synchrotron is, what an accelerator is, the CERN. And <laughs> but what a distributed infrastructure is in social science and humanities is less obvious. I extracted some facilities here, and you see that we can have also an integrated array of small research installations. This is a distributed infrastructure as well. But we can go uh, beyond. We can have center of competence providing services for the community. And these services are not only the instruments, but more than the instruments are the expertise. So the competencies, the, capabil the capacities of researchers are part, uh, a structuring part of a distributed infrastructure. We heard about Daria before. Last but not least in our field is very important that <coughs> archives, collections, libraries are all considered by the commission as research infrastructures. And last again, data infrastructure as well is found in part, and is more and more important in the operation of European research infrastructure, the use of digital support. I feel compelled to give a short definition also of the heritage science concept, because it's uh, quite a new term. You know in the UK there is a, an heritage science foundation, but until the last years we were used to conservation science. But we felt that conservation science is a field that now is too restricted to allow us this over-encompassing view about the possibility of inclusion 
of these communities that I described into the European infrastructure. So we needed a new term. And we are trying to see if we can use the heritage science term, but we want to use it in the most possibly inclusive way. <coughs> this perhaps makes us, as Charisma was, one of the most multidisciplinary infrastructures in the landscape of Europe now, and the better in the future. Charisma had multidisciplinarity in the title of the project, and already being presented, joined 22, 21. There's been an amendment during the, pro the, the project. <laughs> 22 European research institutes, but more than 22 research groups. And it's being coordinated by <coughs> Bruno Brunetti, who should have been here, but unfortunately has got uh, strict involvement with Charisma accounting, by the way, <laughs> for the final closing. And so he cannot uh, reach us. And it, the multidisciplinarity of this infrastructure is in the participants. All the centers that you see here in the partnership, the conservation centers of large museums in Europe, they are very multidisciplinary institutions. And all together, we have a very nice uh, community of researchers in all domains. And what we want to establish in Europe is kind of a common disciplinary scientific domain where there's no absolutely difference between an art historian and a physicist because both are working for heritage science. The nice point that perhaps is one of the most important uh, difference between the concept of, uh, let's say, conservation science and what we want to reach, it stands in the end users for years and years in Europe and in Italy in particular. We were used to see the art historian, the archaeologist, as the end user of conservation <laughs> science. And this has been guiding the development of this domain in the very wrong way. It's like in medicine, the end user for uh, an equipment is the physician. You develop diagnostic equipment and the end user is the physician. Something is sounding very bad here. The end user of heritage science is the heritage, is the cultural heritage. And so in medicine, when you devise a new instrument, your end user must be the patient, not the physician. <laughs> so what we will try to change is the view. And the, uh, I must confess you, this is, has been for at least the last 20 years a very strong view that is uh, um, spoiling the possibilities of development of this uh, disciplinary field. So the new project that we submitted, and in something like one month we should have the outcome, the formal outcome, is called Hyperion CH, Integrated Project for the European Research Infrastructure on Cultural Heritage. This is the follow-up of Charisma, and so this is the project supporting the cultural heritage community. As I told you, the core mission of the project is, of course, going on providing the same services of Charisma for at least four more years, but also establish the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science. The proposal of Hyperion is limited just by, let's say, mechanism in the European project range, because we could have assembled a partnership of the widest possible, but we were limiting for more or less administrative matters uh, to keep the sides of the Charisma project, because the Charisma project was already a very big project from the point of view of management. So it would have been impossible to increase the sides of Hyperion uh, where we would uh, have liked. However, we have more than 35 institutions now for 24 separate partners in 12 member states and with a very important addition. And it's not important because we are in the US now, it's important in itself that we have the Getty Conservation Institute as full partner in the project. And so we have a uh, international extension and this door that it is, it is opened with, with the US 
to have a stronger collaboration between the project and the landscape of infrastructure that is moving here in the US. However, uh, about the activities. The activities are the common activities for uh, European research infrastructure. The special feature of the Hyperion project is in the kind of access that is provided. This is structured in three integrated platforms. And these three integrated platforms are one, which is rather classical, is the access to large-scale facilities, fix a lot, the last one. In this sense, we are uh, a kind of an interface for uh, easing the use of large-scale facilities to researchers in our community. But the more specific platforms that we have into the access provision offer are the Arc Lab, which is a collection. In the project, we have 10 archives of scientific data from 10 conservation institutions. Uh, when I say archives of scientific data, I say only partially digitized archives. So archives when, where you need to go there to do research. And there are a lot of non-digital archives around Europe. <coughs> so this one is a feature that is uh, pretty uh, peculiar of the project. Another peculiar feature of Hyperion is the mobile laboratory. The mobile laboratory is no more uh, a novelty in Europe because it's, it was established 10 years ago by the pre-predecessors of Hyperion, the project URTEC, when for the first time the Commission considered a collection of portable equipment and the knowledge how to use them as a real research infrastructure. This was a big breakthrough for research in cultural heritage because you know that you have to move instruments 90% of times. You cannot move artworks and objects. And so now we have uh, a mobile laboratory composed of five separate platforms in five countries with their offer of portable cutting edge instruments. And we are to provide this service of uh, in situ diagnostic for probably if the project is approved for more years. Another peculiar uh, activity of European infrastructure is joint research. Joint research mainly dedicated to the advancement of the offer of access, better archives, better labor mobile laboratories, and better uh, devices at large scale facilities. Then we do a lot of international cooperation, and this is the good part of the European uh, we are really trying to uh, establish what is called uh, the European Research Area. In our, in our case, we are a very old community. We know each other since years, and we are uh, reached a very good level of integration and cooperation. I must say, this is a very, a very big family in Europe. Is the, the cultural heritage uh, community now? For the first time, we uh, try to focus on digital because you heard before uh, the colleague Costis. There's a lot of you humanists that are not using digital tools, but also in cultural heritage, digital tools are not common. It's not the routinely work yet, at least in Europe and institutions for cultural preservation in Europe. So there's a lot of work to do. And for doing this, we made a strong alliance with Daria Eric Daria is one of the 24 partners into the proposal. And I am very involved with Daria because I am the Italian national coordinator too. So there's, uh, I must say there's a good level of cooperation now. <laughs> then we will uh, care about the impact of our activities, especially now that we are in the roadmap to try to develop this permanent infrastructure. So we want to do a lot of dissemination. We have to, we have to teach our researcher to use the tools that we provide, to use the digital tools, but also to use the advanced instruments that we uh, I have, have in your uh, mobile laboratories. We do uh, also education and training, summer schools, training camps, as you will see. And we care about sustainability, because that's something that uh, the, the, the colleague by the commission didn't told you, that when you establish an ERIC, all the support shift from Brussels to uh, the member states. 
So with BASIS, you have just one reference point for uh, going on with funding research. Then in the case of Daria, you have to contract with 15 separate bodies. So the situation is more complex than it appears. However, there are tools around, and so being a permanent European research infrastructure is not so bad after all. While we were preparing these in the last two and a half years, we succeeded in starting up uh, three national projects that are now funded, that are the Iperion CH in Portugal, that has been approved and financed with 1.5 million euro, and now it is in the Portuguese national roadmap. The Iperion CH in Greece, which has been admitted to the Greece national roadmap, but not yet uh, financed. And the last, the Iperion CH project in Italy, which is in the Italian national roadmap, and of which I'm the coordinator. The national uh, main node of this project uh, is Florence, where most of the partners of Charisma, from the scientific point of view, were already located. And this project is to support the Hyperion Europe and also the establishment of the infrastructure in Europe. These are the four partners who contributed more <coughs> to the activities of the first year, because Hyperion CH Europe is uh, going on since eight months. So it is actually a project, not a proposal. And you see the Institute of Nuclear Physics, uh, the Institute, the, um, um, the collection of universities in the chemical domain, more than 47 university, INSTM. is something lost in translation with uh, <laughs> inter Interdepartment Center for uh, Science and Technology of Materials, but it's very long and complicated. And our uh, Diamond Point, the Epificio delle Pietre Dure in Florence, the partner from the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, one of the better centers for uh, conservation and restoration of cultural heritage in Europe. What we did in these months, we started with pilot actions, and we did a first training camp in the city of San Sepulcro in Tuscany. Last summer, we got, in a very short time, 33 uh, postdoc applications. 20 persons were selected, and we had five days of on-field work. We practically occupied the, the small city in Tuscany with instruments everywhere. You see in the cathedral, then in the civic museum, a lot of young people around. And I must say they were very happy of this first experience, so we will do it again, even at national level, we proposed the European training camp in the Hyperion proposal, that perhaps we will have European training camps. But we, also, we will also go on with national training camps. Then we issued the first pilot call for national access, so to provide services with the, platform, the platforms that you saw at national level. And we got 18 proposals. We had money for five, but we decided to make some economy. We are now about to perform seven diagnostic projects around Italy uh, on pieces of several of different natures. This you see this very, very important and beautiful mosaic from the Archaeological Museum in Naples. So we got uh, here something linked to archaeology. We have a project for diagnostic of hypogean of cave heritage. You see is from uh, Apulian. But also more traditional for the Charisma Group projects, like the diagnostic of Piero della Francesca in the Pinacoteca di Brera in Milan, and something more modern, because one of the applications that have been financed is doing more diagnostic in Venice to this series of Pollock paintings at the Gagne, because we already did something with the Molab of Charisma last year, but they called us again. And the proposal uh, has been approved by this uh, panel of international reviewers that we set up in a hurry. And we are starting this operation. We will have this access national campaign until uh, end of spring. Coming to the conclusion of this, I must say that the more obvious way to create a permanent uh, research infrastructure in Europe is to be admitted to the S3 roadmap that has been 
well defined and discussed before. The S3 roadmap is calling for the new infrastructures right now, and the call will uh, will be closed on the end of March. And the, as you saw from the um, table presented, all the infrastructure in social science and humanity are exiting the old roadmap because they all became ERICs. And so we are applying for being included in the social science and humanities column. We had the kickoff meeting of this group in Rome. And here, we didn't limit it to the Hyperion partners, as I told you, because we had uh, this general meeting with the other communities. And we try, we are now writing the application. So the acronym will not be Hyperion of the uh, arrival, possible arrival of this roadmap, but will be something like RIHS. And we have, uh, to, together with the other communities, archaeologists and, uh, and paleoanthropologists, we put together an impressive community of international cooperations. Only the Hyperion proposal collected more than 20 applications for not just sub genetic support, but actual, actually affiliation to the project once the project should start. And several applications came from, from the US. I must cite the Library of Congress here, but also the Chicago Art Institute. In, and uh, from close to the US, we had an application from the Canadian Conservation Institute. But one of the most important application, and you see we got application from practically all the world, including Taiwan. And perhaps we will have more application from China now because we had an, a meeting three weeks ago. The most application perhaps that reached us was that of the intergovernmental organization, ICRUM, uh, which uh, asked us more than that. Because really, in recent times, I must say two weeks ago, we had this proposal from the Italian delegate in the group of senior officials, which is a group uh, linked to the G8 plus 5 advisors of science ministers. There is a special group that perhaps no one of you heard about. <laughs> it's, a, it's a group of advisors who are caring for uh, infrastructure of potential global interest. And we had, we have, we had the proposal to apply for uh, consider er, uh, the infrastructure on heritage science as a possible uh, infrastructure of global interest. We submitted a questionnaire to this group just last Friday. And the meeting of this group will be in a few days in Rome. And the Italian delegate will apply this proposal to the table. Over this, with a very quick action, I must say, the ICROM proposed us to host the seat of this global infrastructure. ICROM is hosted in Rome, but it is a UNESCO organization set up by UNESCO in 1956. And with an agreement with the Italian government, he's hosted in Rome. ICROM could be the legal seat of this European slash global infrastructure. The game is now bigger, but we are very happy to be playing it. I thank you for your attention. And our fourth speaker this morning is Dr. Franco Nicolucci, and he will talk to you about Ariadne. Ariadne. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will briefly introduce myself shortly, and with some more uh, time, the uh, this lady, Ariadne, uh, which is a project for uh, ecological data networking in Europe. Well, first of all, uh, the project is about archaeology, and you uh, will be perhaps uh, be surprised 
to hear that it is led by a, a person with a degree in mathematics. Uh, probably this is good for the project because the archaeologists have a reputation of quarreling continuously, so they need some order, and who better than a mathematician could bring this order? Uh, the, well, the Ariadne is a nice acronym, as you can see from here. It summarizes the, the, the purpose of the project. But it's also a good metaphor, because Ariadne is intended to be the, 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 the person, the, the character, uh, who will uh, help uh, the research community and each researcher to get out of the labyrinth after, hopefully, killing the Minotaur that is the chaos uh, in uh, archaeological deficits. So, uh, it's a, it, this is a research infrastructure project. Perhaps you, at, at the point of, of, the, of the meeting, you are confused with all this uh, European community jargon. You have heard about ERICs, which are permanent structures, uh, like a, a permanent research center. The best image I can give you is CERN in Geneva, which is stable, funded by governments, and has no uh, has, uh, infinite duration. Uh, I had made not like that. And there are other projects, like the one that uh, Luca presented before, which uh, so far are still working, integrating uh, um, different infrastructures with the goal of uh, uh, getting older, become adults, and uh, be uh, turned into such a permanent structure, like Daria, which Costis uh, presented before. Uh, fine, we have not this ambition so far because we are still in the kindergarten. Uh, the project started only two years ago, and so we are looking around and collaborating with all these uh, uh, older uh, sisters, like Daria, and like the, the forthcoming uh, project by, by Luca, to, to, to do something which I will try to explain. Uh, the project has a four year duration. We started about two years ago, so we are midterm now, with 23 partners from 17 European countries. And it's coordinated by a, a, a small research agency of the University of Florence, not directly by the university, but a, a research agency created by the university for uh, managing uh, research projects. And we are affiliated to the idea which already cost this introduced. So why? Why is such a project? Well, to have fun, first of all, but I could not put this into a slide. And uh, actually, there is a huge number of archaeological data available in digital format. And nowadays, uh, uh, computers have made their way also into archaeology. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the way uh, that computing uh, came up was uh, very much based on individual activities. So most of these archaeological data sets are not, are not non communicating. They are information silos. On the other hand, there is an increasing interest of the search community for sharing such data, both passively, that is, uh, accessing data prepared by others, and actively, offer their data for, for sharing. There are uh, interesting statistics, uh, and usually I refer to uh, one made in the US, which shows that uh, uh, almost all, a very high percentage of, of uh, archaeologists uh, interviewed for this, uh, uh, about this, this topic uh, um, stated that they were willing to reuse data available by others and also to make their own data available to others. So there is a strong interest. And above all, there is a strong pressure by the society, or better, the, the better informed uh, parts of the society, for opening such data vaults. It is uh, becoming uh, uh, people that not understand why, what is uh, uh, funded with uh, public funds, and with data that were collected and uh, organized and stored with the money coming from the, the collectivities uh, is not available for, for social uh, uses. As you can see from this map, the, the Radio Partnership spreads uh, all over Europe. There are a few exceptions here. We, are, we did not yet make the Eastern campaign to, to collect the partners from 
easternmost Europe, but either with our the, the core partners, the black spots, or with asso uh, associated partners, the green spots, uh, we are covering uh, most of the uh, European Union uh, and also other nearby countries which are associated. Of course, we do not limit our scope to Europe. Uh, we have connections with uh, other uh, institutions, uh, uh, especially in the US. We have uh, uh, contact with uh, uh, two or three universities uh, uh, which are doing a similar uh, work, uh, and we are looking forward uh, to be able to establish uh, uh, closer contacts and uh, closer collaboration with them. Uh, same with, uh, with Australia. So what to do what? Okay, shape research community. We do not want to uh, prepare a um, top-down solution because it would not work. Of course, the, 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 the goal is to share access, use and use archaeological data, overcoming the current fragmentation of data sets. Supporting interoperability. Fragmentation is not just a matter of uh, uh, data set split uh, among different servers and different repositories. <coughs> that such data sets uh, do not talk to each other. It is uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to extend uh, uh, the use of archaeological data over different data sets. And to do this, we have to establish accepted standards and common protocols. Uh, standards in our vision should come uh, bottom up. There is no way of choosing a standard, having it approved by ISO, and then uh, imposing that uh, to researchers. Uh, and then, and then, enable research discovery. That is being able to see where information about some some topic, some subject is stored, and find it, and perhaps. Uh, not tomorrow, but in, in some years, uh, to be able to do faster research, searches, that is, search for what is available about the second century BC or what uh, is available about uh, Greenland, for example. I don't think there is much archaeology in Greenland, but you never know. And explore new methods of using this information in the framework of the uh, traditional uh, archaeological uh, methodology. Of course, to do this, we will need to create useful tools for searching and browsing. But connecting, not assembling. We do not want to create uh, a, a, an overarching big brother of archaeological data extending over all, all, all Europe uh, and possibly in the future over all the world. So linking, connecting, not assembling. Making data discoverable, accessible, understandable, and usable. Okay, so some, some diagrams, I will not go into details because these are rather technical. I usually put this in slides uh, just to show that I know about uh, technology and computer science. <laughs> show off, but I will not uh, insist on that. The idea, however, is simple. You have on the bottom here plenty of data sets created in several uh, uh, contexts, uh, research projects, uh, management, and so on. And then what you do here, taking data, actually mostly metadata from all these data sets, and these are some examples. These are data centers, uh, oh sorry, uh, collecting information from different uh, 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 repositories, and then you may remember the horizontal uh, uh, layer, uh, as, uh, integrating them. So what, how are we going to do this? Uh, well, networking, establishing collaboration among archaeologists to overcome fragmentation. So the first thing to integrate the data sets is to, to integrate people uh, who created those data sets to make these people talk to each other, which is not easy uh, with archaeologists, but it can, can be done. And in uh, um, uh, so far, my estimate as I told you, I'm a mathematician, so I like numbers. I estimate that there are about 100 uh, researchers working in the project. I mean, full-time uh, equivalent, which is not uh, that little. It's a good number of people. But these are, I would say, paid by the project. And there is about uh, uh, 1,000 researchers in Europe, 
collaborating with the project somehow, from inside or from outside or part time, or just looking at our uh, uh, newsletter or participating in our special interest groups. This over a population of perhaps uh, 50,000 archaeologists in Europe. So we have spice, uh, space for enlarging and uh, growing up the community. And we, we will are currently correct, correct, collecting, recording and providing information on what is available, which stuff are around, and this will be stored in a, in a project registry, publicly uh, accessible, so I hopefully in a few months, if you are interested to know where some information about some subject is stored, you can check our registry. What is going on? So, uh, checking what, ha what is happening around the world and what needs to be done. So, establishing a research agenda uh, uh, with uh, our collaborators, but also collecting information from relevant uh, uh, research centers and experts uh, uh, around the world. Training on, on innovation, of course, some training is needed. And doing research on, as I said, standardization uh, of metadata uh, schemas and reference work. So, uh, Tesori, Gazetteers, authorities, uh, and you will uh, believe me if I tell you that uh, this is uh, not an easy task. When, when working in archaeology, there are, uh, for example, uh, time periods which uh, look very simple are actually very complicated, uh, not to say messy, and it's very difficult to, to um, use them across uh, different uh, traditions, schools, countries, and so on. Designing interoperability and implementing interoperability Creating tools for uh, uh, using at best all this uh, interoperability framework. Carrying the data life cycle, most of the data sets uh, which I have seen uh, uh, being created uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago are no more uh, available because they, they were put on a floppy disk and the floppy disk is no more readable. Somebody has lost the floppy disk. The floppy disk is available but nobody remembers what is, what, what is in and so on. So caring of preservation, and uh, also establishing new methodological tools as, as a tool. For example, this is a diagram of a mapping. I will not go into the details again, just to show that I'm also an expert in knowledge engineering. But this means that you, if you have two different uh, DAFA, DAFA, uh, metadata schemas, how you can uh, uh, match concepts uh, 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 between, between them, and this example maps the Italian uh, standard created by the Central Institute of our Ministry of Culture. It uh, maps to an international standard, which is uh, uh, CEDOC CRM. Uh, perhaps uh, those of you who know better archaeology have heard about it. And so it, it may establish uh, crosswalks between the data sets uh, organized by Italians with those organized by uh, other centers in the world. And this is a medium-term perspective, which Perhaps we will not be able to implement uh, in Ariadne, but will be uh, useful uh, to get more funds to continue the project uh, afterwards, after the four years, and which uh, tries to create uh, a stronger integration, not just uh, research discovery, and then you are on your own uh, interrogating different data sets, but creating a stronger level of integration availing of the standard that the project uh, will create. I think there is another slide. Oh, well, okay, this is uh, what we have done in two years, but you might not be that much interested in this. Uh, so, okay, we have done surveys, established a draft research agenda. All these things are available on our project website. We have created the, the registry, as, as I told you, some uh, initial mappings, uh, so I started establishing integration between uh, uh, different data sets Actually, currently we have uh, uh, more languages used in data sets than official languages in Europe. In Europe there are 24 official languages. We have also data sets in Arabic, Latin, Catalan, and I don't remember what else, but more. So one big problem with us is the uh, issue of uh, multilingualism. 
for example, which is particularly hard when you try to experiment natural language processing. So we have started from the easy part, English, then we are moving to Dutch, Italian, French, German, and so on. Probably uh, Catalan will be the last one because we have so few data in that, uh, that language. Okay, success indicators, don't take it yet. Again, I want to show off, showing how clever we were and we arrived to the uh, targets in two years, I mean two more years uh, to do more, but just because some numbers are interesting. Numbers interesting, okay. Uh, for example, as I told you, uh, we have uh, reached about to to about 3,000 uh, researchers, which is a pretty good number, I believe. So, uh, uh, of course, only part of them are working, but the, most of them are aware of what is going on. And we have about uh, 5 million euros uh, currently for 1,700,000 uh, records available for integration. We will not be able to integrate all of them, but we hope to do that for as many as possible. Many of these records are not database records, they are documents. They are text documents, uh, excavation reports, for example, uh, which are more difficult to integrate, and that's why we are, uh, we are uh, testing these natural language progress, um, processing uh, tools. And I think that's all. I have to acknowledge support from the European Commission. It's, uh, uh, you and uh, actually the European Commission has made a great job with this. Not only because they funded us, which was a good idea, but also because uh, the, the European support uh, enabled us uh, to fight against uh, uh, some conservative approach which was still present uh, in uh, uh, many academic circles. So if this is made possible, it's not only because Europe uh, put the money, but because they put, uh, they supported the idea, which is a great merit to which I think uh, must be acknowledged. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And our final speaker this morning, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marriott Westerman. You've, we've heard a lot about the European framework and structure and as many of you may know, we, we're not really that well coordinated and integrated here in the US. And Marriott has kindly agreed to give some comments and notes on the digital humanities in the US today. Marriott. Thank you very much, Fanella, for inviting me and, and introducing me with a cautionary note. About 10 days ago, I was asked to speak at the Netherlands Congress for the presentation of the National Research Agenda for Art History. This was a Congress in the Netherlands, and I had to give a response from the American perspective. And of course, I started my response by saying that whatever was in that agenda, I was absolutely green with envy that there was such a thing as a national research agenda for anything uh, in the Netherlands, <laughs> let alone art history, because we're just not used to thinking in that way in this country, although perhaps we should. And listening to these very impressive presentations this morning, I was wondering if my American colleagues here uh, share my similar sense of envy uh, similar sensation listening to this roll call of programs and initiatives, competitions, forests of acronyms, uh, through which you have roadmaps uh, that are then to be navigated with boatloads of dollars, or euros rather, millions and even billions I saw past review. We have no such thing in the United States. Just to give you a quick comparison, I didn't do this. I should have thought of doing this again. I did it for the Dutch example. For um, the arts and humanities, the annual budget of this country of 320 million people is uh, about $500 million. That puts together the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute of Museum and Library Studies. So that's $500 million a year of federal funding. Of course, lots of money comes from other places. But that $500 million translates into about $1.56 per person who lives in this country per year for arts and humanities. Um, in comparison, for the Netherlands alone, a country of uh, about 16 million people, 
Uh, it's one and three quarter billion, not counting 900 million in sort of university research support, which mostly goes to science, but also to the humanities. It comes to something like $130 per person. So that's sort of the difference of scale we're talking about. And it is perhaps not surprising that Fenella therefore asked a representative of a private foundation, which is what I am. I'm vice president of the uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which is entirely dedicated to the arts and humanities. and and gives out as much money a year as the two endowments I just mentioned combined. And I say that without any sense of pride at all. In fact, I find it very depressing and we would quite like to have more support for the sort of work that we do. So, without further ado, let me try to uh, give you a sense of the sorts of things that we at the Mellon Foundation are seeing when it comes to the digital humanities and uh, digital infrastructure for cultural heritage research. I refer to this talk as a set of notes because it would simply be impossible to give a fair overview of the digital humanities in the US as I was asked to provide in 20 minutes. From its origins as a fringe field of humanities computing in the 1990s, digital humanities, as we've already heard and seen, has become a complex set of practices and attitudes at the intersection of humanities research, computational technology, and new media and communities in new media. Moreover, I am a real interloper because I am not an active digital humanist myself. And under normal circumstances, my colleague Dawn Waters, who I think is well known to many of you, and who is senior program officer for scholarly communications at the Mellon Foundation, he would be the one making these remarks. But he is today leading a workshop in New York on the reconciliation of linked open data which is a highly germane topic, certainly, for digital heritage research. He and I work together frequently, however, or rather he advises me frequently, on grant projects in the digital humanities, both in research universities and in cultural heritage institutions such as museums, libraries, and archives. And I hope that I can give you at least a bit of a sense of the work that we are funding for the development of digital humanities infrastructure and of initiatives that we believe to be promising and then I'll close with a couple of concerns that we are seeking to address uh, these days. So it is the mission of the Mellon Foundation to strengthen, promote, and where necessary to defend the contributions of the humanities and the arts to human flourishing and to the well-being of diverse democratic societies. I think it's always important to remember why we do the things we do at all. Now, Although we make most of our grants in the US, we believe that the health of the humanities and the arts in this country as elsewhere depends absolutely on robust international collaboration. It seems an obvious point that the forces of war, trade, migration, and colonial empire have long conspired to disperse cultural heritage objects around the world, even if unevenly so. And therefore, international dialogue and collaboration are vital to the development of research infrastructure for humanity's cumulative record of creative and cultural achievement. And I'm therefore very pleased to be participating in this transatlantic conversation. The Mellon Foundation's support for uh, digital humanities broadly conceived has evolved considerably over the past 15 years. Having initially focused on aggregation of digital resources and objects, most notably in JSTOR and ArtStore, and on experiments, uh, fledgling ones in online education, we soon realized the importance of letting scholarly communities guide the agenda for the sorts of resources, tools, and protocols to be developed for the humanities in the internet age. Similarly, we have looked to curators and conservators, some of you here today, to define and develop new tools for the documentation of research and conservation that are involved in the con uh, or around the collections that these curators and conservators manage. I will try to show how our approach is affecting the initiatives we support and how those activities connect to broader developments of digital humanities infrastructure we are seeing in the United States and, and internationally. Rather than support solitary digital humanists, we try to identify groups of scholars who are thoroughly rethinking what humanity scholarship and teaching can become with digital content and with digital tools. 
These scholars, of course, invariably are contributing to the building of digital repositories of primary source materials. But massive digitization is not the object or not the objective of our support. We're past the JSTOR and ArtStore moment. Instead, the foundation focuses on the ways in which scholars are building new research communities and modes of collaboration to advance knowledge, quite in the way that we heard earlier today. The work of these groups of scholars clarifies requirements for tools that support data curation, joint research, information exchange, peer review, and also publication in the digital realm, or even what digital publication means. Three areas of spe special attention that I'll uh, spend a little time on now. Uh, these three areas are the digital provision of primary sources for the humanities, the development of virtual research environments, and the closely associated creation of annotation tools. So primary sources, virtual resource environments, and annotation tools. And uh, because I, I developed this paper quite late, it wasn't really clear that I would do this until recently. I have no PowerPoint. I also know that sets me apart <laughs> as, as a humanist, probably. But if you are interested in some of the things I'm talking about, I'm happy to give you references in the breaks and so on. Just, just come up. Primary sources. In the humanities, primary sources, whether of a documentary, literary, or artistic kind, are what observational data are for the sciences. They constitute a field of observation. They are a huge part of our collective humanities data set, these primary sources, though not the only part, not the whole part. Don Waters, my colleague, argues that what data means may need to be redefined if the humanities are to participate in digitally enabled research and teaching. Today, data is, as you all know, identified primarily with numerical definition and binary structure, even though the basic meaning of the Latin is just the things that are given. To humanists, the things that are given are our primary sources, whether they are manuscripts, printed books, works of art, maps, musical compositions, field notes, photographs, newspapers, video, broadcasts, or websites. While some of these <coughs> things that are given, such as census records or corpora of literary texts, can be transcribed with ease and made susceptible to quantitative analysis, for humanities research, most, uh, most of these data need to retain and convey something of their physical quality online. So that's a challenge, I think, for data and, in, uh, and digital humanities. And as it is in the nature of humanities questions to be pretty much qualitative, uh, and as it, as it is in the nature of these questions that there will be limits to what quantitative analysis is ever going to tell us that we might want to know, we are unlikely to see in the humanities the fundamental sort of transformation that turned genetics into systems biology once genetic code could be quantified or made numerical. We're not going to see that huge a shift. I think we have to be really realistic about that if we're still going to recognize the digital humanities as the humanities. The foundation's efforts in the digital humanities are therefore focused on the identification, description, and presentation of our data, our primary sources. Our efforts are also focused on new modes of scholarly exchange and collaboration around those data and on digital publication that in the humanities itself becomes a form of data because the humanities are very discursive and primarily discursive. And I think, although I can't get into it, the distinction between primary and secondary sources, which is always a slippery slope in the humanities, is perhaps in fact becoming a little more meaningless in the realm of digital data. Uh, someone's opinion also becomes a data point very quickly in the humanities. But these questions, I think, are for uh, another conference. The foundation has supported the development of scholarly communities in ancient, medieval, and early modern studies. That's where we focus this digital humanities work. All of these initiatives involve textual corpora as well as other types of cultural heritage objects. One instructive example 
is uh, the, the Integrating Digital Paperology Initiative, IDP, the Integrating Digital Paperology Initiative, which is a, was an effort to bring together three digital databases for the study of papyri, which are, of course, vital resources for the study of Mediterranean uh, heritage from the Egyptian Old uh, Kingdom all the way through late antiquity. One of these papyrological resources, the Duke University Data Bank of Documentary Papyri, was established three decades ago to provide transcriptions of papyri in Greek and Latin, just a transcription effort. Another resource, the Heidelberger Gesamtverzeichnis der Griechischen Papyrurkunden Ägyptens, contains bibliographic information on pretty much the same data set that the Duke database had, but they were completely separate projects. So that's bibliography. And at Columbia University, the Advanced Papyrological Information System, or APIS, provides images of and metadata about papyri from two dozen different cultural heritage institutions. Although each of these resources and their project leads had strong feelings about the proper transcription, cataloging, and presentation of papyri, 10 years ago, they at last agreed to enco encode their databases using a common XML standard and then make them searchable through a shared interface. This was a painful effort, but it did get done. Then what happened? As soon as scholars in the community at large could see the images, transcriptions, and the bibliographic data in one place, they started peppering the project team with objections and corrections. Of course, they could see all these mistakes, right? Undeterred, the project team developed an editing environment in which registered users could submit corrections, translations, and, and in fact contribute previously unpublished papyrus fragments. Contributions are vetted by a board, which can authorize super editors to make changes. So after tough initial negotiations and many years of pain, the integrated system has become a runaway success. The community has added hundreds of unknown documents, corrected countless records and transcriptions, and it's begun to use the system in teaching in Germany as in the United States. One of the leaders of this effort is Roger Bagnall, the director of the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at New York University. And he has noted that the collaborative editorial process fundamentally distinguishes this shared resource from the three st static databases that it aggregates. It's really a different kind of animal now. As he has written, and I quote him, this resource no longer represents at any given moment a synthesis of fixed data directed by a central management. Rather, we see it as a constantly changing set of fully open data sources governed by the scholarly community and maintained by all active scholars who care to participate. One might go so far as to say that we see this nexus of pepperological resources as ceasing to be projects, in quotation marks, and turning instead into a community. Lines between curating a database, editing records, and publishing what we used to call a critical edition have become blurred. So now I will turn to the question of the virtual research environment. This first was about primary sources and how they really become sort of new kind of critical editions online. The Papyrology Initiative was driven by university scholars and supported by robust information technology that universities can provide more easily than museums, but it draws on collections of papyri that are held by many cultural heritage institutions. I believe that the initiative has much to offer museums and archives that have struggled long with notions of what is a curatorial publication. Curators usually publish collection catalogs only when they are satisfied that they have gathered all available information and written up their analyses of all objects to the highest possible, most incontrovertible standard, and that the catalog can therefore stand, if not the test of all time, at least perhaps 20 to 30 years. This is the standard for publication that's based on print modalities. The digital dispensation and its expectation of timely provision of information is putting a lot of pressure on this practice today. 
The pepperological example shows how the scholarly world, stewards of collections, and ultimately the public can benefit from a more transparent system that allows information to be available quickly for scrutiny, correction, and shared scholarly discourse. In 2009, the Getty Foundation, which is an important funder together with the Getty Trust, of which it is a part for arts and humanities in this country, in any event, in 2009, the, to the Getty Foundation funded an online scholarly cataloging initiative that encouraged experimentation with online cataloging publication in nine museums, including the National Gallery of Art, which responded very well to this. Although the initiative hoped to find a common model for publishing collections research quickly and interactively and perhaps more dynamically, the initiative soon had to relinquish the goal of a common format. Each institution developed its own modalities of catalog publication appropriate to its culture with varying degrees of flexibility and responsiveness to research updates. Most held to the view that there should be a set date of publication for a catalog rather than a more fluid system of knowledge production of the kind I've just described that would allow for updating, information exchange, and external contributions and corrections. Attractive publication models ensued, to be sure, but it would be a stretch to call these catalogs virtual research environments, which essentially the pepperological resource has become. Initially, by happenstance, the Mellon Foundation ended up supporting the development of such virtual research environments, or VREs, in a fledgling sort of way. If, if museums are protective of curatorial prerogatives in relation to their collections, and there are often good reasons for that, but they are protective, if, if museums are protective of these curatorial prerogatives, conservation departments have historically been even more cautious about releasing information about treatments of their works. In 2007 and 2008, international meetings of conservators convened by the Wallen Foundation surfaced considerable dissatisfaction in the community with this protective state of affairs and interest in improving the management and exchange of data that are generated every day in conservation departments. Much conservation documentation, after all, is of interest not only to the conservation disciplines, but also to scholars who are interested in materials and processes of art making. This is an area of research often called technical art history in the United States. Consensus emerged, more or less, that the internet could and should facilitate interinstitutional communications and joint research in conservation. In response, the foundation funded the collaborative development of conservation space, an open source software application that addresses the need for an effective documentation management system, about which I'm happy to see you will hear from the National Gallery's Merv Richards, who is a PI for the project so I won't say more about it. The foundation also supported, at that time, five pilot projects that sought to develop vigorous collaboration online around the oeuvres of particular artists. That was a good organizing system, it was felt. Cranach, Rembrandt, Raphael, the Maestro di Filiene, and also the Southworth and Halls photography firm's inventory. Unlike the Pepperological Initiative, each of these experiments digitized primarily visual materials and artifacts, as opposed to uh, manuscripts. The projects developed tools for the analysis and representation of knowledge about these works, and they developed collaborative workflows and discussion mechanisms for contributors in different institutions talking to each other. Two of the resources scaled up to viable long-term projects we still support today, the Rembrandt database and the Cranach digital archive. And they have become open-ended alternatives, I would say, to the <coughs> traditional catalogue raisonné. They're, they're really not single author uh, objects like catalogues raisonné of an R. All, were effective, all of these projects, I would say, were effective use cases for what a virtual research environment specifically focused on works of art might be. Scholars collaborated with digital technology teams to design these resources, and they tailored process and product to the state of research and opportunities for developing a shared database 
pretty artist at hand. They were very focused on specific materials, which is an important way to generate methods, probably. Now, that customization for each project was both a strength and a weakness, because as you already figured out, each database was structured to suit the legacy technology of the lead institution or the needs of one particular community. There's a strong sense of if it isn't made in my house, I can't work with that other one, right? So in 2000, and we realized that that's an unsustainable uh, model in the end. In 2009, in consultation with the projects, the foundation decided to support work towards a technological solution that would make knowledge in these differently structured databases of cultural heritage institutions accessible to semantic search. Out of this resolve to create a more sustainable technology that would be more or less independent of underlying databases, out of that resolve emerged the project called Research Space. Research Space, a project that is led by the British Museum to create an environment for cultural heritage research online. The environment utilizes the CDOC CRM, Conceptual Reference Model, data structure and contextual search technologies to allow data from different sources, wherever they are accessible on the web, to be discovered and then presented in an integrated fashion through an, inter, through an interface that's homogeneous. It looks the same for wherever the data come from. But the data themselves, of course, retain original characteristics and contexts in the way that humanists like. Research spaces, ontologies, and tools are being developed with the British Museum's vast own store of linked open data, along with those of Yale University, the Rembrandt database, and a few others. And I hope that within a year, the project will be ready to release its first open source production version uh, for testing by others. A few more comments. First on annotation, that was my third example. For virtual research environments, like research space or any others, that aggregate and present digital heritage objects to flourish, they need to be equipped with analytical tools that are useful to humanities scholars and understandable to them. Perhaps the most common and time-honored tools of the scholar are those that support annotation. Back to antiquity, of course. Scholars annotate to reference other materials, to present comment, to present critique or to suggest emendations. While many online resources, of course, allow for annotation of all sorts, scholars complain of the cacophony of annotation standards across projects and platforms or among different media, such as texts, images, and video. Sharing annotations with others or even with yourself across platforms or discerning who said what when often proves very difficult. In response to this problem, a community of computer scientists and humanists working together from the Los Alamos National Laboratory, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the Universities of Illinois, Maryland, and Queensland in Australia, these, these folks have together formed the Open Annotation Collaboration, OAC. We have acronyms too sometimes. <laughs> the groups has developed, this group, this Open Annotation Collaboration, has developed an Open Annotation Core Data Model which specifies a framework for associations, for associations that you can make between related resources, using, again, linked data standards of the semantic web. Open annotations with this data model can easily be shared between platforms, and they are focused on very simple tasks that we do, such as attaching a text to a single web resource in an um, unambiguous way. The Open Annotation Collaboration is now refining standards in nine use cases that range across media from medieval manuscripts to streaming video content, both in research cont context and publication contexts. I will conclude these remarks with a cautionary note that helps explain a current direction of the Mellon Foundation's support for digital humanities infrastructure and protocols. Along with many others who support digital humanities infrastructure, we have learned quickly that aggregating and making available large collections of primary sources, from manuscripts and works of art to maps and video, is a lot more difficult technologically. These cultural heritage objects are harder to be, ma to be made available at scale, harder technologically, harder financially, 
than the online provision of secondary sources such as digitized journal, journal articles or born digital commentary to which you can just link. And within the primary source category, it has turned out to be more difficult to agree on the most effective presentation of materials that need to be studied in their visual and even physical form. In contrast to texts that can be reformatted reliably thanks to inventions such as OCR and the text encoding initiative that's been hugely successful. To make the required investment in rich digital heritage object infrastructure worthwhile, we need to grow communities of scholars and curators that are interested in using and contributing to it. This community is at present too small. A gap persists, we think, and we think it may be growing, between those who create, and it's, someone spoke to that already this morning, uh, between, a, a gap persists between those who create resources for digital research and the majority of humanities scholars and students for whom these resources are intended. Well, I know they're intended to support the humanities and the digital heritage, but nonetheless, we think that people are going to use these things. Although in most universities, the digital reshaping of <coughs> humanities is indeed quite evident, it is far from pervasive or unanimously shared. While all faculty and students use online resources today, the fundamental transformation of academic practices that is encompassed by the term digital humanities is still limited to small groups of scholars who are dedicated to the sorts of initiatives I've been describing. To bridge the ravine between these two levels of familiarity with digital frameworks for humanities research, the Foundation is now funding initiatives that familiarize new cohorts of faculty and students with the conceptual frameworks, the lines of inquiry, and the very skill sets that are required for work in the digital humanities. With these grants to particular universities that are also connected to each other, the doctoral students who are the faculty of the future conduct digital humanities research, build it into their dissertations, reflect Importantly, they reflect on the evolution of the humanities in the internet age, and they learn to teach undergraduates, undergraduates in digital humanities protocols, although I think a lot of the time it's the undergraduates teaching the doctoral students, not to mention the faculty. Now, to this really well-informed community here of digital humanities scholars and scientists, this effort may sound like a remedial education distraction from the urgent infrastructure development tasks at hand, but we believe that it is critical to the future of digital heritage research. The tools that we build will only be as good and robust as the communities of scholars, students, and yes, citizens at large that will use them and benefit from them. We need scholars and students to develop the questions as yet dimly envisioned that our digital tools may allow us to pose. We don't know yet even what the questions really are, do we, a lot of the time. Having larger cohorts of scholars ready to use digital humanities resources is not enough, however. We also need scholars to help curate the data that make digital resources come alive. Given entry into the realm, as many of us have seen, most human, humanists see very quickly that making manuscripts or works of art available online for scrutiny, analysis and critique is itself a creative scholarly act on a par with the development of the critical editions and catalogues of the great print tradition. To enable emerging scholars to participate in the development of primary sources online and the tools needed to curate them in fact, the Council on Library and Information Resources here in Washington has launched three sets of data curation fellowships for postdoctoral scholars in medieval, early modern, and visual studies. These areas were chosen because their complex interdisciplinarity requires access to data in textual, visual, and spatial media. The fellows are placed in universities or institutes with a track record of developing digital collections and digital scholarship. They perform all sorts of specific data curation activities and hold joint appointments in a university department where they then can help familiarize fellow humanists with the wonders 
and opportunities of digital data curation and research. As early as 2002, John Unsworth articulated the view that for now, the best hope for the digital humanities is the semantic web, which will make possible formal representations of the human record in ways that can be contextualized and ask questions of meaning rather than number alone. As Unsworth put it, those representations should be produced by people trained in the humanities in concert with computer scientists. I hope that these field notes, which is really all that they are, will have indicated that the Mellon Foundation subscribes to that view. We're very curious how you think we might all together accomplish that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and I think um, I know from discussions previously with colleagues that we are incredibly envious of the, the integrated, long community uh, in, the, in the European community. Could I please ask the other speakers to come up and join Mariet here at the front? And we will now open, the, uh, open to questions. I will repeat the question because this is being webcast. And I, I will in a moment check to see if we have any uh, questions from our uh, uh, participants as far away as Europe and uh, right across the world. So, questions? Yeah. I'm sorry to jump in right away. That was an incredibly stimulating bunch of presentations. And I want to make sure that I have a chance to ask this question of this particular group. The question is really for m most of you. And it's about inclusion and exclusion, and winners and losers. And particularly, what I want to <laughs> hear from anybody who is willing to address this is your ideas about what to do with the much broader world of people who are producing digital data and who could benefit from sharing it or borrowing it, but who, because of the shrinking pool of funding and because of the way funding opportunities work, are going to be excluded from the consortia or the granting programs that most of you are involved with. And I speak as an academic field archaeologist at a large state institution. Um, I am Could you please state your name? And yeah, I'm sorry. My name is Adam Rabinowitz. I'm at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and thank you, many of you, for the things you said today, which really set me up for some things that I will say on, uh, on Tuesday morning. Um, but I am very well aware that what happens with opportunities to participate is not dictated by the quality of the project involved in all cases, but rather by a series of fairly random circumstances, depending on the NEH uh, panel of experts who's reviewing you, depending on your institution's gatekeeping for things like the Mellon Foundation, and if the NEH uh, funding rate for projects in digital humanities is down at about uh, 12 to 15 percent. That doesn't mean that 85 percent of the projects are bad. It just means that they only have room for so many. So what do you envision in terms of expanding the resources and communal efforts to a broader community of people who don't have the money to fund the CIDAC CRM mapping of their data sets, to, who don't happen to be at an institution that has a virtual resource and a research environment? And I'm just going to repeat that for those who are webcast. That was very long. <laughs> uh, this will be a very abbreviated version. So the question was from Adam Rabinowitz: the inclusion and exclusion, and ideas about pe people producing digital data. What do the panel members envisage uh, in the expanding of research to funding the st sustainability of data sets from people who may not be able to get uh, funding? It won't look at me. I don't know why. You guys have all the money. Um, <laughs> Speaking of money here. <laughs> I'm happy to address the American context. I'm happy to address the American context. Um, I, you know, so I am, as I've already said, I am not a technologically, terribly technologically enabled person, but I certainly am somewhat often 
optimist, or I certainly feel at least that these pro it's very important for these products to be as open as they possibly can be, and for mechanisms to be designed, technology to be developed that makes the ingestion of data that are relevant to particular projects easier, simpler, the sharing of them uh, more cost effective. After all, even uh, people who produce data sets in institutions are still supported by those institutions to do that in some way or another, just because they work there or they have IT infrastructures and so forth. So I'm really interested in as I already said, in a way about broadening this cohort of participants in the communities, finding good enough solutions and not only the very latest, best and optimal, because I think that's the only way you're going to scale these sorts of things. I think an inspiring figure in this regard is Will Noel at the University of Pennsylvania, who oversees very special collections and is a huge um, advocate for maximally open sharing of materials and also generating of participation to the point of crowdsourcing the information. So technologically I don't really have an answer but I know that there will never be enough private or public funding in this country to cover, to, to create, give everyone his or her own virtual research environment. If I may just start by, by a qualification of the you know, sort of financial situation with, for humanities research in Europe. I have the benefit or probably the trouble of working on both sides of the pond. So in Toronto, I've got students, doctoral students, who would have research grants in order to come down to Washington DC and work on a collection at the Smithsonian Institute. They have fully paid uh, uh, fellowships in order to conduct doctoral research. In Europe, it's a different situation. What happens especially in the humanities is that the humanities are really sort of looking at these projects with uh, uh, the anticipation that will be, they will be able to sustain basic, basic research funding and support. And this is, this is one of our troubles. So to go back to the positive side and to respond to Adam's uh, uh, question, not to the side that has to do with the uh, limited funding of uh, the arts and humanities, this is not something that I am the one that could respond, but to what we can do as infrastructures. I will start with one qualifi qualification. I like the fact that we talk about something being fun, because uh, I remember Arjun Apadurai's notion of uh, the archive being really a, an object of desire. And I say an object of desire, like all the objects of our research, that is also consequential. That is a meaning, that has a consequence, a pragmatic impact on people's lives, on our understandings, and our human development. So I like that, but I'd say that the uh, words can cut both ways. As you may have noticed, all of you, we use a lot uh, the word science when we talk about humanities research in these projects. And this is no accident. In our languages, in the Greek language, the Italian language, there's no firm and hard distinction between the notion of a humanity and a science. This has consequences. And these consequences percolate out to the kinds of research that are privileged by our projects. What we try to do, and we try to do that in Daria, we try to do it in Ariadne as well, mm -hmm. through the, uh, the opportunities that we give to researchers to come up and have uh, residential fellowships and to be able to participate in, in summer schools, is really to allow the community to take hold of what they can do. Because otherwise we'd be in a situation in which we'd be sort of dictating, in a sense, nomothetic, uh, sociological method, hypothesis-based research and that alone. And in some disciplines within the art and humanities, this can work, but in many ways, the humanities are ideographic. In many ways, the humanities are hermeneutical. And some of the challenges of using meaningfully digital technology have exactly to do with how we can tap the ability of representation systems, and representation is central in this, remain central, knowledge representation, in being able to account for the discursive nature of all our constructs. So these are things that are open, that are out there. For archaeology, I see with some envy uh, less well-funded projects, such as, for instance, the Sustainable Archaeology Lab of my colleague Neil Ferris from the University of Western Ontario. Why? Because I see that Neil and his colleagues has a commitment to different alternative understandings of Ontarian First Nations archaeologies. He brings in the communities, so he engages in a different discourse. And I say so probably for the benefit of my colleague from the commission who is <laughs> on the funding end of uh, this, uh, this table uh, in order to be able to sort of put the point that the, the what happens in this, uh, in this continent is meaningful because of that. 
I would see more, for instance, funding for uh, uh, the study of uh, under-curated, unpublished uh, uh, archaeological data sets and collections that are already there. All the documentation, the archives of past excavations, that is so meaningful, so important, which is very, very humanistic in nature. But what I'd say is, yes, I mean, what one expects and what we try to do in Europe with little money, with the two and a half million that we got in hard money, because the rest of the eight million in Daria is in kind contributions. It's work that people put in their institutions. It's not money in that sense, right? So what we uh, we try to do is really to put that money uh, to function like a, like a glue, like a, a, a connective agent, like a, a conduit that allows people to, to work together rather than try to fund primary research for that money. But we feel that some of the stuff that we do at this secondary level is, is important in that direction. Yes, I, I have a general response uh, as a generalist, and I don't know whether it will be satisfying for Dr. Rabinovitz, but I wanted to say that um, in, at a time of uh, shrinking budgets, uh, um, uh, fiscal constraints, um, it's the collaborative approach that's going to allow us to put together our resources uh, to, to have a greater impact and to be able to share those resources and use those optimally. So the European approach to that is to encourage transnational research within Europe, but also you know, connecting European infrastructures with, with those in the rest of the world. And, and I, I think that that logic um, continue, you know, it extends uh, internationally. Um, so I, I think it's something that the, the, the current U.S. administration uh, understands in that um, the annual guidance that's given by the, uh, the Office of Management and Budget in the United States and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, the, the annual um, guidance uh, for this year for the, uh, I think it's the 2015 financial year uh, budget, um, advocates to science funding agencies and departments to use international co collaboration wherever it makes sense in order to extend the uh, efficacy of the uh, uh, of the funds that are uh, and budgets that are available here in the United States and so we welcome that in Europe as a as a means of putting together what we have with what you have where it makes sense and where there are mutual benefits to make sure that as many people as possible have access to the ideas the expertise the facilities the data as, as possible as, and to put those together sensibly. So as a response to fiscal constraints, more international collaboration. We have one question from our remote uh, viewer, Mike Ashfield, and this is for Professor Nucalucci. Yes. Uh, his question is uh, whether Ariadne is including, so I'm trying to read my terrible writing now, it's, it's trying to, it's, um, focusing on the long-term preservation and access of CAD and 3D files, and if so, which file format do you prefer to preserve? Do you encourage others? No problem. And yeah. you probably have about three minutes to answer what will probably take about 25. Oh, uh, so if I, if I understood it correctly, the, the question is about long-term preservation and formats for uh, special and complicated data like 3D. Well, uh, first of all, long-term preservation uh, is not uh, uh, an activity which we are currently um, carrying out because the, 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 the purpose or the, the goal of Ariadne is integrating already existing activities. In Europe, there are actually already, uh, I think, at least uh, three or four national centers. One is ADS from the University of York. The other one is TANS in the, the Netherlands, maybe as and in Sweden, and many others which I now I don't remember, that is not worth quoting, which are already providing uh, long-term preservation for archaeological data. So what we are uh, currently doing is uh, establishing uh, guidelines for uh, preparing data uh, suitable for long-term preservation and then addressing interested uh, centers or researchers to those centers, uh, the ones uh, which I mentioned. As regards to the, the story is a bit more complicated because uh, there are currently not so good uh, uh, management systems for um, uh, 3D data sets. Uh, or there are no established uh, systems for managing 3D uh, uh, data concerning uh, archaeology and cultural heritage. There is a plethora of, format, of formats which uh, sometimes uh, create uh, 
uh, well, uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, difficulty for, uh, particularly for heritage researchers and for archaeologists, because they, it, it's unclear which one is better for the purpose. Sometimes it's, uh, there are some uh, formats which are uh, uh, theoretically preferable to others because of simplicity and also because of long of, uh, they, they are um, better suited for long-term preservation. Other formats which, are, uh, which have better performance on computers. So there is a still a need of carrying out some research one of these services we, we, which Ariadne will provide will be a visualization service for 3D data and a storage service uh, for 3D data. Both, uh, I should say, at an experimental level, but from what I have seen and what I will be presented in the next few days uh, uh, are almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the level of... Uh, uh, being used by by a wide uh, a wide um, uh, audience and uh, wide public, uh, there is, there are some issues. These are mainly let's say organizational and political. Uh, there was a, a a call for proposal by the European Union to establish a three D, uh, well uh, to establish a framework for standardization of three D for cultural heritage. I'm not sure that it will, be, it will have a good uh, uh, end. So probably, if this happens, if uh, no good uh, thing comes out from this uh, call, we will have to take on us also the the, the work of establishing or pr establishing standards. What means involving the community because Ariadne is a community-driven uh, project. Involving the community. To, to set up uh, a well sort of uh, accepted uh, and shared uh, standard for using 3D for archaeology. Thank you. And I'd just like to follow on. Uh, one thing we hope will come out of this meeting is to try and share the links to a number of different initiatives. Uh, I know I have colleagues at KU Leuven who are actually with the UNESCO chair, they're actually working on standards for 3D uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 formats. and. Here at the library also we're very focused on, the, through the Office of Strategic Initiatives, really focusing on sustainable formats. One thing we've started to look at is preferred formats where we can't exactly tell people but we can tell them what we would prefer in terms of sustainability. And do we have other questions? And having an audience that uses the data, making a community, presupposes, I think, that the system that they're accessing is reliable. And that involves the time factor. So in, I guess my question is, in a community, in a landscape where technology is evolving quickly, and there are many initiatives we can buy into with our very limited time, do your initiatives have a lifespan built into them? How long do you predict your tool will be useful? And is there a structural administrative provision for keeping them going? Because it's not just about the community keeping it going and building it. I think there has to be some structural uh, organization that's committed to making these last decade, at least a decade, say. So, um, so Adil, sorry, I'm blinking on your surname right now from the Smithsonian. And the question is, and I, I love this, we've got these wonderful, wide, overarching questions, but would probably take us three days to discuss each one. But really is talking about the gaps uh, and reaching the audience, and in terms of the landscape and the tools that are available, is there some sort of life, li life structure uh, built into the initiatives to actually ensure that the technology stays up to date with people being able to access? Yeah, that is where European infrastructures are coming into the picture. As we discussed today, we can do very nice things over projects, but projects have the problem of having a determined lifespan. And then what? And the one of the example is the bamboo project, for instance. So we are trying to set up infrastructures like Daria, the first established in digital humanities, to have a longer time span of organization and perhaps I'm 
cannot say of long-term preservation because long-term preservation is, goes beyond anything. It's a very, very complicated issue. But however, to preserve results, digital results of successful project is one of the major commitment of European research infrastructures like DARIA and like we will be the heritage infrastructure for heritage science because they give stability to the picture. The, the initial commitment for a European infrastructure for member by member states is five years, but the lifespan of infrastructure is much longer expected. If you consider uh, how long the, the CERN infrastructure is going on since tens of years. So the question from John Delaney at the National Gallery of Art was, we've heard from the, the higher level, what are the lower level foci on tools to align data more effectively? And just I'll quickly note that I know some of the presentations will be digging down into that over the next couple of days. Uh, well, yes, of course, uh, it's, it's complicated that I see it even more complicated to, to make the, 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 those data sets interoperable, and that, that's clear. Um, mm, what we, the solution or the partial solution we, we we are giving to this issue, is to go by steps. The first step should be, as I, as I perhaps I already mentioned, <coughs> resource discovery. So having a homogeneous interface uh, to know uh, uh, where where is where uh, where are things and how how you can access them which is not absolutely interoperability, but it's uh, facilitating access. And in, at that level, you, 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 you work on a, mm, let's say, meta-metadata uh, level, level, that is description of data sets only. And then uh, this can be done in a, a standardized way. We, Ariadne has developed a, an own model, which is pretty well uh, working and since there is no previous experience uh, uh, in, in, in this field it's easy to convince people to adopt this model when you try to go to the individual record uh, records that is go beyond the, the collection level but go into the individual uh, data the situation as you say is uh, much more complicated actually we have discovered that there are several uh, data sets which are adopting uh, either uh, fully or in part or are inspired by the uh, CRM standard, uh, which is being used by the British Museum uh, for uh, research space, but is also being uh, at the basis of several important data sets. So we start from the easy part of it. Since there is so, so much work to do, we start from where it is simple. And the, one of the pictures I have uh, showed in my presentation concerns a mapping. Uh, between uh, a, a huge uh, data set in Italy, which is about uh, 500,000 records, and the, the the standard, which will be used, uh, uh, which will be adopted by the project. The same is being done, for example, for the data set of the German Archaeological Institute, which is another huge data set. British Museum, with which we, are, we have a collaboration, will be also feasible because they are using, uh, uh, adopting CDOX RM. So the the well, things are better than one expects, uh, and in any case, start with the easy thing, and then the problems will come. Uh, there will be time for, for problems. And as you see, I'm pretty old, so it's, it will be my, my <laughs> grandson uh, who will be in charge of, of those problems. Please. I just want to add a qualification about what we do in uh, my, the Digital Curation Unit in Athens. Very specific stuff. I say so because uh, the DCU is involved in the national uh, DARIA effort, also we're involved uh, in Ariadne with uh, as a partner. Uh, now, what we do, 
uh, we take uh, information integration as one important aspect of, uh, of the work. But we feel from our experience in projects such as Carare and then LoCloud, these are projects that aggregate uh, uh, metadata records for then uh, resource discovery in the Europeana Digital Library. Uh, what we found is that uh, there is a red herring in the notion of uh, um, significant properties or fitness, future fitness or purpose, if you don't sort of situate these significant properties and this fitness or purpose within a specific context of use. So in this case, we've got a clear scenario of why we aggregate these resources. So what we do is we provide crosswalk mechanisms and mapping mechanisms between uh, one uh, metadata schema and another metadata schema. We take seriously preservation, long-term preservation and audit aspects of these metadata schemas as they're stored and preserved <coughs> within the repository. And we sort of work in, the, in that uh, dimension. We use OR aggregations in order to be able to bring different aspects of complex objects into views that are meaningful in contexts of uh, use. For instance, how to present uh, information resources that relate to one particular cultural object or another cultural object that is a representation of another cultural object uh, uh, together in a single view. So this is what we do in this you know, sort of constrained uh, uh, environment. But what I want to say for the discussion is really that uh, I think that there are limits to the notion of standardization. And I say this, don't take me as, I mean, this is not an official view, it's my personal view, that we need to review very, very seriously efforts that uh, are almost unilaterally and uh, uh, to the community and also almost unidimensionally in terms of effort directed in taking individual views, emergent views about uh, the realities of uh, the cultural world and standardize them into common representation formats. In my experience with students, because I gave them open possibility of working with no SQL databases, with really, really open, non-qualified uh, representations. What I find that people, smart people with a humanities background, uh, would create completely different representations than those that are imposed by our common schemas. And I think we should be careful not to stifle progress by imposing too much standardization. That, that seems a very important uh, cautionary tale, uh, indeed, and suggests that even the semantic web can't solve everything, even when, when all data in the fullness of time will be linked. John, your question seems very important to me, and I, I want to go back to it and say two things uh, related to these very important online scholarly cataloging uh, initiative projects, which really did make a lot of progress in some ways and, and often turned out very, very high quality product, uh, including uh, the first catalog put out uh, uh, by the National Gallery of Art. I would say two things, however. Um, in universities, uh, in academic cultures, it is just, just a standard observation to make, I think, that faculty and scholars are extremely good at inventing new things. They're very creative. They are very, very bad at letting go of what they have, even if what they have is perhaps no longer quite as necessary if you have that other thing. We're not very good at calibrating these things. This is true across universities in many ways and is one of the reasons higher education is often yelled at now from all directions, right, and left about being wasteful and so forth. And I think there's a lesson there to be learned probably in that online scholarly cataloging initiative as well, in that everyone, again, wanted to have their own way of doing things and doing things to a standard that was of the traditional, really high quality print catalog. I don't want to belittle that. I think it's great. I'd love to have them all this way. But to Adam's earlier point, I think it's hard for us to get there uh, for all institutions. So I, I continue to sort of advocate not mediocrity, but solutions that recognize the dynamic and fluid quality of research so that we can make progress maybe a little bit more quickly in getting things uh, out there. And the second thing that relates really to that point is um, what I think is sometimes a forgetting in the digital environment because we're so used now to these really high quality images on our screens. They're so pellucid, they're so alluring, the desire, <laughs> you know, the, the image is also an object of our desire, that we've forgotten that for most of the history of digital heritage studies of all kinds, including archaeology and um, 
art history, the image was always just a surrogate. It was never the real thing. Uh, only for digital art actually turns it out not to be the case. So I think we really have to think very hard about when we can live with <coughs> something um, that perhaps can be standardized a little bit more and that is really good enough to advance the kinds of questions we want to ask. That's a really intriguing idea, and with all this talk about digital data, the object still reigns supreme. And this is not some, this is something you can't forget, but you have the tantalizing ability to start to be able to visualize these data um, in a virtual environment. And I'm wondering, where is this research going? Can virtual reality actually be realistically brought into these databases to provide a realistic uh, understanding of, of that object in a uh, non-traditional sense? Mark Walton from Northwestern, and the question for our external viewers was, how can the virtual reality be used to give us a better integration and understanding of the original object through the digital survey? Well, it depends on, on your definition of real. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, well, I, I can explain. Uh, let us assume that we, we are analysing this thing here, and uh, I am... A, art historian, and they say, okay, this, this has a shape which is typical of uh, the first quarter of the 21st century, and that's enough. And they, perhaps I can do this just using uh, a two-dimensional photograph. If I'm an archaeologist, I perhaps I want to go uh, in depth and analyze what in, in, in what it's seen. There are uh, some, some cracks, something more, and I can... Uh, I then can do my, my job uh, using uh, a very good uh, 3D uh, replica of the, of the object. And so I can, my, my visual um, research environment must include 3D because I can, I can look at it from different sides and understand it better. Uh, for some archaeologists, and particularly for uh, conserva conservationists, for conservation people, a, an excellent uh, a 3D model Visual 3D model is not enough. They need to know the material. So the 3D model must convey not only information on the shape, but also information on chemicals, chemical composition, uh, spectra when uh, excited with uh, particular rays and so on. Well, look, I can explain better all this kind of uh, manipulation that you can do with, with objects. So the uh, the, 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 um, uh, the replicas uh, uh, must convey different uh, um, characteristics uh, which depend on the use you are going about them. In any case, in any case, there is a, a very important aspect which concerns the quality of the replica. Quality of the replica is not a feature, it's a process. So you must document how you, 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 you created this replica and uh, which instruments you used, uh, and what we, how was the environment uh, in which the replica was created. So that anybody, not just saying this is a good replica, this is an excellent replica, the degree of, of excellence of this replica is 10. That doesn't count. But everybody must be able to uh, trace back the process with which you created the replica and you in incorporated in it uh, different features, shape, color, texture, uh, information about the, the colors of the originals, information about the chemical properties of the original, and so on. And uh, so you are the judge if the replica is good enough, is real enough for your purpose. Sorry. Also at the Library of Congress, there's a wonderful group. It's called FEDAGI, the Federal Agencies Digit Digitization Guidelines Initiative. And we've spent a lot of time on uh, two-dimensional objects and uh, three-dimensional objects and audio and video okay. workflows pointing to formats that are acceptable, but deep documentation on how we got there, just as you discussed. Uh, 3D is the next... Uh, Okay. Uh, challenge, and uh, I'm, I'm sure this group will be undertaking that. But that, that, that's an online. Um, um, 
And uh, Ellen Newman was just pointing out the uh, FAGD group, which is open to federal agencies and I believe other interested institutions. I'm afraid I haven't been to a meeting for a while, but the focus is on sustainable and uh, developed, um, structured, robust file formats for a range of different formats, from still images to moving sound. And it's, it's very well right. integrates the needs of a range of different institutions. Well, I know everyone has been sitting for a long period of time, and I just want to thank our speakers very much for an incredible uh, introduction to the next two and a half days and very thought-provoking discussions. A few things I, I noted came through very strongly was the focus on standardization, which is something I think we really need to discuss. And also the fact of data sharing. I, I really liked, I think it was Luca referred to, Madeline Franco, the idea of passive to active, being passive to providing that data. And I think that's something we have to think about as we really integrate the, the whole community of people from the curators to the physicists and stop that demarcation between the different fields but see us all as a community focused on cultural heritage and the preservation of it. So thank you very much. Please all delegate, delegates, if you will uh, wait, uh, I want to send a huge thank you to the National Gallery of Art who has sponsored lunch today. So um, we'll thank them. And right now, huge thank you to our speakers from this morning. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.